uh, I want to say the things that I should say concerning uh, my appreciation for the meeting and for the care that the church takes for us. I love the church. Y'all have always took care of us, the whole crowd, and uh, I love this church. Good church. We need them. We need good churches. Y'all agree? Amen. Amen. I want to give you what I got and get out of the way, and uh, y'all pray for me, please, that I'll be able to convey the concept that I desire to convey. The book of Titus, of course, we understand is Paul writing to this young preacher boy, this Gentile preacher, and uh, he's giving him some counsel uh, concerning uh, the things that he needs to say and do to those cities in Cretia. And so um, I went through it and I started noting how that there was a running theme of a need for you to be sound. And that kind of caught my mind and my eye and my heart. Uh, I actually have been working on it now for several weeks, uh, trying to nail down exactly the direction of it. Uh, wasn't 100% sure about whether or not I'd preach that here. Uh, and so I, I, uh, uh, in my studies, I, I always get me some books. Uh, where's my brother? There you go. How much time do I got? 50? Oh, I'll try to do less than that. Okay. Anyway, uh, and I got uh, Dr. Knox's book on Titus, James Knox. And so um, in my study of it, there is a, a word that is going to be used in my sermon today that's in Titus chapter 2. And I was uh, wanting a good definition of that word. Well, I was looking through his notes, and he said, refer to the works by the author by definition. And I read that at home. And I thought, I, I, I need that book, that book of by definition. And when I got here, they started handing out these books with a lovely bookmark in it. And it was his book, by definition. Uh, and uh, it's the Holy Spirit, you know, he has the way to saying, all right, you done arguing. And so I, I just submitted that that's the direction God wanted me to take. And I appreciate you, the church giving that book out. That's a blessing. Uh, and, of course, I enjoy Brother Knox. And so I settled in on dealing with this concept of your need to be sound. I titled it, When You're Not Sound, You Don't Sound Sound. Did y'all get that? When you're not sound, you don't sound sound. And there's a reason for it, and, of course, this is going to be somewhat personal sometimes to me, uh, due to things that, you know, I'm dealing with in my life and everybody has something they're dealing with in their life. But the need to be sound is throughout the scriptures. It covers different areas or categories where soundness is expected. And the idea of what it means to be sound can be understood when we consider the way the phrase is used even today. Uh, I can give you some illustrations. For instance, when someone said they're sound asleep, when we use that term, it means a person is completely asleep. That's a simple understanding, yes? So they're completely asleep rather than partially. Yeah. When someone is said to be financially sound, we see a security and a strength that produces a reliability. To look into a sound financial person or business, you discover that which is within causes the business to be reliable. When a person uh, presents an argument, and that argument is said to be a sound argument, it means their words have a solid foundation, a solid content, and a solid conclusion. In other words, there's no holes in it or no areas of inconsistencies or weaknesses and no place for it to be disproven if it's a sound argument. In medicine, when a person is said to be sound, it means that they are not sick but healthy through and through. And I like that concept of being through and through. You, you're the same all the way through. That's the concept of being sound. Y'all understand that, yes? This is seen in the account of the prodigal son in Luke 15, 27, when the servant said the brother has come and he's been received safe and sound. And we use that term, safe and sound. The idea of the safety is in his location. The idea of the soundness is in his condition. He's both safe in his location and sound in his condition. 
Uh, this view is also seen in carpentry when inspecting a piece of lumber. It can look fine on the outside, but be damaged within by insects, and thus that piece of lumber is not sound, no matter how it looks. And quite often you can take such a piece of lumber and strike it and it will break, although it did not look like it would. Uh, this material is said to be unsound because it's not the same throughout. This is often proven by knocking on a piece to see if it sounds the same overall. So you knock on it, you take it, you take your knuckle, you hit it to see how it sounds. And it don't sound sound. It sounds hollow. When it sounds hollow or it sounds off, amen, then there's something wrong. Maybe you don't know exactly what's wrong. But it just don't sound sound. This idea is uh, seen in a building or a structure that's deemed to be unsound. It's one that has become weak or damaged over time. Then you have the reoccurring phrase that is used in such official documents as a will and testament. And they say they are of sound mind. And that means that he or she has all their mental faculties. So the prevailing understanding concerning the term of being sound is that the subject is completely the same throughout. It is reliable due to its strength and stability. It does not have areas where there is inconsistencies. It is whole. It is well. It is strong. It is complete. It is consistent throughout. And it, as such, can be trusted. Amen. Uh, uh, we have in this number... Um, Myriad of, of positions, you got men that are preachers, you got men that are lay members, men that are deacons or, or men that are workers in the church. And uh, we preachers have a tendency, if we ain't careful when we get up to preach, we kind of preach to preachers in a setting like this, sort of like we're making an assumption everybody's a preacher, but not everybody's a preacher. And, and uh, there, 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 is, there is a, uh, a right for you to expect certain things from the brethren around you. As a pastor, uh, there's nothing wrong with me expecting my men that uh, claim to be something to be what they claim. Ain't nothing wrong with me expecting that. Equally so, the men of our church has got the right to expect me to be what I claim to be as well. And we all should be sound, trustworthy for one another. And when we talk to one another, it ought to sound sound. And the things we say or to support the concept that you can trust me. But sometimes you start dealing with someone or talking to someone and you don't really know what it is. You don't have that omniscience of God so you can't put a tag on it. But something sounds off. And there is a warning in your heart. That was an odd thing to say. That that response was not what I was expecting. And you wonder what's going on. And I personally recently have dealt with such a thing. Where you think that someone is a certain way and you find that they're not. I'm not trying to be ugly here. That's just true. You find that they're not what you thought they were. And then uh, hindsight's 2020, and you look back and you see all them red flags. Where you was dealing with them or talking to them, you hear them say things, and when they said them, you thought that was odd, that was off, that's not right, that's curious. Why would you think that? Why would you say that? Why would you go there? What are you doing? And 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 because of a desire that you just don't want to believe anything bad, you convince yourself, well, it's just you. But folks, it's all right for you to pay attention to the warnings of God in your heart. It is not you being judgmental. It is not you being a harsh. But there are times that you need to pay attention when something don't sound sound. Now, when you get into the passage and you get into the book, uh, sound doctrine is throughout. I got no uh, doubt in my mind that this group gets sound doctrine. You're not going to hear me say, y'all need to be preaching sound doctrine because I believe that you are. Everything I hear every time I come here is solid as a rock. The Bible is preached here. Can y'all say amen there? Amen. And, and, and you, you men that are here, being here, knowing that, you would immediately say, I, 
I want to hear the Bible preached. I'm a Bible person. I, I'm going to make that assumption. And so you're not going to hear me get up and say, hey, bless God, y'all need to preach sound doctrine because I believe that you are. I believe that you are. And I believe that, 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 that y'all sit under sound doctrine, but not everybody that sits under sound doctrine is sound. You have to allow the doctrine to do something to you and in you in order for you to be sound. I can prove that here in our passage. Throughout the Bible, you have terms like the sound mind or sound words and sound doctrine, a sound heart throughout the Bible. In this, uh, he establishes the task of Titus. If you'll look at chapter 1 and verse number 5, he said, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. His task is seen in the cause explained. Set in order the things that are wanting, he says. The statement implies a lacking in some areas in the churches and the cities of the area. To set them in order shows the need for some type of organization. Things which need to be set in order must therefore be out of order. They need to be set in order. And that's okay. That's actually Bible. Y'all agree? And so I can tell you that things need to be in order, and that's sound doctrine. Because he told Titus, set them in order. So uh, we understand that this is revealed in the verses that follow. In verse number 9, he said, holding fast the faithful words. The faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, to convince the gainsayers. Verse 10 and 11 shows that there were those who were not in order. He literally says in verse 10, they're unruly, they're vain talkers, they're deceivers. Verse 11, their mouths must be stopped. And so he's showing how that there is a cause uh, for Titus to do something to set things in order. The correction is then employed when he says for him in verse 5, to ordain elders in every city. Now, if you go on down in verse number 7, he says it's a bishop. I believe that shows that in this specific passage, the term elder is applied to the term bishop. Now, I don't say that's exclusive, but it does apply. And if you want to add that to others, that's fine. I wouldn't argue. But there is no doubt that he's showing how that he needs to ordain elders. And in that ordaining of elders, he is placing men in a position of a bishop or an overseer. And he goes from verse 7 all the way down through chapter 1, uh, rather going down through it, showing how that these bishops need to be and their qualifications. And I'm not getting into all of that. And y'all can study that on your own. But the ordaining of these elders is the means whereby he is setting things in order. Evidently, somebody needs to step up that have been ordained by Titus to get things in line. And that's the means that God has chosen. Are y'all all right with that? So we see the correction employed. We see the commission is expressed. He says, uh, ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Of course, this is Paul. Now, in verse 1, Paul says he's a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. In verse 5, he says he's appointing Titus. In verse 5, Titus is to ordain elders. Each one of these stands on the authority of the previous. So Paul says, I'm a servant of Jesus. Paul says, I'm appointing you. Paul says, ordain them. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying to you? This is... The authority of each one, I have no authority. I, Tim Shirley, in and of myself, I have zero authority. I have no right to tell you how to live or what to do. I, I am a man just like you. If I tell you anything, I cannot base it on me. I must base it on what is written in that Bible right there. That is sound doctrine, amen. However, if, if I give you sound doctrine, I have that authority to do so. You are to abide by that sound doctrine. I say amen. Uh, this has got nothing to do with your preference. And I could really preach here and get bogged down. I really could. 
Uh, but Brother Tony, he has, uh, he has a myriad of preachers. They have different styles. It's irrelevant. Well, I, I don't like him. I'm not going to, well, what's he saying? Well, what's he telling you? And where's it coming from? Amen. Well, I, I don't like his demeanor. What is he saying to you? And I believe there is something to love and meekness and all of that. But the message is what matters. Do you all agree with that? And so each one stands on the authority of the other. This established authority will produce a soundness in those churches. They are out of order. They need to be in order. And so Paul, the servant of God, the apostle of Jesus, uh, he appoints Titus, who is now a servant of Paul, who is a servant of God, who is an apostle of Jesus, to ordain elders. Those elders are being ordained under Titus, under Paul, under Jesus, under God. I say amen. Amen. That means who's the boss? God. And I like that concept, all right? Then the course is expounded. You go to chapter 2. This is where I'm going to be. And in chapter 2, he addresses five categories. It goes from the aged men to the aged women to the young women to the young men to the servants. And in all of this, in verse number 1 of chapter 2, the course expounded, he says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Then you've got a colon at the end of that passage. That colon at the end of the passage shows us the following passages are the result of sound doctrine. Sound doctrine received, sound doctrine received produces sound Christians. Amen. I'm going to do it again. Y'all ready? Sound doctrine received produces sound Christians. And y'all understand sound Christians through and through. Solid, stable, trustworthy. Y'all understand? Amen. Sound doctrine rejected produces carnality. And that carnality will be based on worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom produces strife, and strife produces a sound that is not sound. Worldly wisdom produces a sound that is not sound. James 3, 14, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, devilish. For envying and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. And so there is an understanding then here that when you reject sound doctrine, then you're going to adopt worldly wisdom. When you adopt worldly wisdom, you're going to then become carnal and you are going to be full of strife and every evil work, and that is not of God, amen. So the course is expounded, and the course that he is to use, the ways to go, he is to speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And so this, this then gives us the understanding of establishing the task of Titus. Now I want to establish the targets of Titus. I'm not going to deal with all of them. I'm actually going to deal mainly just with the aged men. Uh, however, I do believe that this does apply to everyone that desires to be godly. Whether you're aged or not, someday you will be. And sound doctrine will produce these things in you. However, allow me to make this statement in our day. Dear God in heaven, aged men that's been in church for years ought to be trustworthy. I get that these young pups have got a lot ahead of them, and I know they're dealing with a lot of stuff, and I know the world is worse than it's ever been. I get all of that, but my soul, and, and, and they're, gonna, they're full of zeal and ain't got a lot of sense. Amen, Mason. I sit down to have a conversation with Mason about the Bible, and his brain goes in areas, and I'm going, what rabbit are you running? And I have to try to catch up with him. And say, oh, and so uh, I get it. But, but, but a love for God, a love for God, a desire to learn, I say amen. amen. And so, you know, these young men, they've got all, but my soul, have you ever seen a day where the elders are quitting? Throwing in the towel, doing stuff that is just absolutely contrary to everything they've ever been taught according to the Bible. And I look, I don't think that it's, I don't think it's unreasonable for me to look at a man that's been in church for years and expect something out of you. 
I ought to be able to say, I can lean on that piece of wood. That piece of wood's solid all the way through. That's not a house that's going to fall down on my head. I can walk in there. That's all right. That's sound. Ain't nothing wrong with me expecting that of you. If you are an aged man, I say a man of the church. And so he establishes the targets, and those targets are five, and I'm not dealing with them. But he targets the aged men, he targets the aged women, he targets the young women, and he targets the young men, and he targets the servants. And if y'all want to study that on your own, you can. But I'm looking here at verse number two, and he says that the aged men be. Now, you'll note, if you will receive the sound doctrine, this, will, this is what you will be. Y'all agree? Is that scripturally solid? So he says, speak now the things which become sound doctrine that the aged men be. Then he goes into these words that he uses. And the first one is sober. And I'll say, first of all, don't get drunk. I want to cover my bases. Amen. Amen. Stay away from alcohol altogether. Y'all all right with that? There's a passage in Proverbs that talks about that you can give strong drink to a man if he's perishing. And I, I told our church, I said, when you see that passage, you got to get the picture in your mind of that cowboy that just got gut shot. And he's laying there, and they're going to cut that bullet out. But he's going to die. They put a stick in his mouth, give him a shot of whiskey. They go to cutting on him, and he dies. So if you want to say, Brother Tim, I think it's all right to drink, you better be dying in the next five minutes. I mean, I want you dead in five minutes. You understand? If you don't die in five minutes, we're going to help you across scripturally. I want to be sound. What's your lesson? Don't drink. Abstinence. Stay away from alcohol. So I can say amen to be sober, especially in our day where the churches are trying to adopt a more liberal view of alcohol. Toe the line, church. Toe the line. Amen. Say no to it. Nope, we're not doing it. Amen. I know of some that have even set up bars inside of a place that is termed the house of God. That is the most ridiculous concept. It is unsound. It is unstable. It is not solid. It is not sure. You men, y'all stand firm. Amen. 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 So to be sober and grave, and these two words go together, not only in the concept, don't drink, but the, the word sober is connected to being sound of mind. It actually is defined as such in some place of being sound of mind. The word grave also is attached to that word sober. These words show a man that has control over his thoughts and is held in place by such. Lord, help me. To be sober is to be sober-minded, sound in mind, to be grave, to be serious-minded. is connected to the word gravity in verse 7. That means to be grave or to have gravity is to have something that holds you in place. To be grave is to be grounded. To be grounded is to be stable. To be stable is to be sound. I am placed. I ain't moving. I'm sure. And I'm not going nowhere because I've got that sound doctrine that has given me gravity. I am pulled to my place. And I'm held here. Are y'all with me? We understand they are to be temperate. Verse 2, having self-control. Defined as having soundness in your control of your passions. You are solid. You are sure. You are not a loaded gun. You are not a donkey on the edge. You got a little bit of self-control. You actually ought to have a lot of self-control. Brother Tony talks about driving here. I am the worst. Y'all heard me talk about it. I'm, I'm, I'm an angry elf. I am so bad that my wife tends to speak in favor of the other people in the other cars. 
Well, honey, you don't know. Maybe that's an old person. Where I respond, then they don't need to be driving. And someday that'll be me and somebody will say, I don't need to be driving. But, I, I, you know, I have a hard time giving them any mercy. You understand? But she, she will actually say good things about those people. And then one day she was doing it and it dawned on me. And I looked at her and I said, you don't know those people. Why are you taking up for those people? You, you should take up for me. Look what they're doing to me. And she said, yeah, but you're just so angry. You shouldn't be so angry. And I felt convicted, and I don't appreciate it. Y'all agree? I didn't appreciate it at all when she said, you're so angry. The Lord dealt with me. You ought to have some self-control. You ought to have some self-control. I said, amen, Lord. And I have actually attempted to do better. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm still thinking the same things I thought. That's right. Amen. When you want to pass and there's a car in the fast lane and they're going slow. Then you've got a car in the slow lane and they're going slow. They're both going slow. And you're thinking either slow down or speed up, but don't drive the same speed. I'm thinking logic here. Y'all with me? Anybody with me? I'm having the thoughts. Here's my thoughts. Whoever's driving that car is an idiot. You're an idiot. All you got to do is let off of a pedal or push a pedal. You don't got to push it hard. Just go a little more or a little less. Just, but you, so that's my thought. But, 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 but I feel like that maybe I let that get out of hand. And so personally, the Lord has dealt with me. You need to have, I say amen. Great damn, 50, what am I? 50 bunch? I'm 50 bunch? 56. I think so too. And uh, I, I ought to have a little bit of ability to hold my tongue or to, to rein in my emotions. Can y'all agree with what I'm saying? And he looked at him and he said, you aged men, if you'll set under sound doctrine, he said, you will get temperate. You will have the ability to control your passions. I say amen. They are then, and he dives into soundness, they are to be sound in three areas. He said that they are to be sound in faith. Do y'all agree? The word in, in the verse where it says in charity, in patience, ties it to the word sound. Y'all agree that? You can read that. Sound in faith, sound in charity, sound in patience. I'm not correcting the Bible. You just need to understand that that's what it's saying. The Bible's right. And there ain't nothing wrong with God looking at us and going, hey, aged men, you ought to be able to figure out I'm talking about soundness in all three. And so there you are, sound in faith, sound in charity, and sound in patience. This all falls under the effect of re receiving sound doctrine. And so there to be sound in these areas, there's sound in faith. I would apply this to two areas. First, there's the aged man's personal faith. You want to be sound, solid, unshakable, through and through, with your own personal faith. Amen. How many of you are saved? Without a doubt, without you. You're ready to go, ready to go. Amen. If the Lord Jesus were to say, I'm coming today, you'd say, even so. Come, Lord Jesus. As far as I'm concerned, you can whoop me out of here. I'm good with it. I'm ready to go. You say, amen. amen. Sound in your personal faith of salvation. Sound in your personal faith of God working in your life. The, the idea, especially for those of us that's been down the road, any peace at all, or to be able to look back on our life and see how God has been there every single time that we have ever needed him. We sit under the sound doctrine and we hear them preachers preach on going through the briar patch and then we go through the briar patch and that experience lines up with that sound doctrine Doctrine, and in order to establish our personal faith that God said he'd never leave me, he'd never forsake me, and it does not matter what happens, I know without a shadow of a doubt I can put my faith in God and God will not let me down. And I cannot tell you how much that means to me today. I believe some of you are going to be faithful to the end. But I know God is going to be faithful to the end. Amen. I need that. Amen. I need to know. 
I got somebody that will never let me down. Y'all agree? The idea of personal faith is something you ought to be sound in. Amen. <clears throat> the aged man's personal faith due to his experiences in the hand of God and the sound doctrine he has sat under in his life has increased his faith. So in this personal faith, he is sound. He believes God. I say amen. This idea was expressed by Paul personally. And he stated that they were sound words in 2 Timothy 1, 12. For the which cause, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And when a man starts quoting or reading those verses, everybody is familiar with those verses. They say, Amen. And you should. But did you know the next verse says, hold fast the form of sound words. What I'm saying is sound. I know in whom I have believed. Sound words. Can you all say amen to that? So if I look at you concerning your personal faith, can you look back and say, preacher, I know in whom I have believed. And he's going to keep what I've committed unto him. That's personal faith. Amen. Secondly, I think there's the aged man's public faith. This concerns his place in Christianity. This is viewed by Jude verse 3 where he told us to earnestly contend for the faith. Of course, when you read writers, they'll say things emphatically. Uh, for instance, one writer said that the term faith is uh, not necessarily personal faith, but the faith, which is all Christianity and all that goes with it. However, I, I tend to want to just go with my Bible. And then I want to say this, that it can apply to both. You need to have personal faith. You need to have public faith. I say amen. The personal faith is what you have in your heart and your mind, and you ought to be sound throughout concerning your personal faith. But your public faith is what everybody sees in your life, and you ought to be sound in that as well. You show your public faith by your attendance to church. You show your public faith by living a clean Christian life as Brother Eddie so wonderfully conveyed to, to be a witness and to be a worker, amen. And that's your public faith. You ought to be sound in that as well. Y'all agree? The aged men then are to be sound, solid, stable, trustworthy, consistent, without unseen inconsistencies as concerning their place in the faith. Amen. You are not showing soundness in the faith, in public faith. If you say one thing when you're here and you say something else when you're there, that is unsound. It don't sound sound. And I don't know if anybody does this here. I do not know. But if you shake the preacher's hand while you're here and you go home and you have him for lunch, that's unsound. You're not the same throughout. We need to be sound. All right, so we understand sound in faith. Then we see sound in charity. You may have to ring a bell. I forgot what time I started and what time I quit. I'm good? There's none good. No, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then he says charity, in charity, sound in charity. Now, charity, of course, you, you got to go to 1 Corinthians 13. How can you not? And 1 Corinthians 13 is horrible. I mean, have y'all read it? I read first. I say I, I need to check my salvation. And 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 so uh, and this is the word charity apparently, which I don't know. And you men, especially you young men, I want y'all to understand something. I'm not on social media at all. I know Tony does some of it, and he is an influence there. And I'm glad he does. I can't do it. I cannot do it. I'm going to just type the word idiot the whole time. That's all I'm going to do. You're an idiot. Brother Tim, what do you think? I'm a, I think you're an idiot. Brother Tim, how would you advise me? I'd advise you to stop being an idiot. That's what I would do. And I know that, and that's not going to work, so I just don't get on there. And will it? I can do it. I can do it. 
And then they say, boy, Brother Tim, if you do that, they're going to attack you. But I'd never know because I would never read. I mean, really, I have that ability. I can just say, you're an idiot and shut. Go away. I don't care. Rant. And uh, so I don't do that. And evidently, if you are online, you do know what is the hot topics. And apparently, the word charity is a hot topic, apparently, about what I've read. That, that you have some say that our Bible should say love. Uh, you understand, you're never going to hear me say that my Bible's wrong. Do you understand? Don't get, don't get nervous when I'm talking. I'm going I'm to settle. I'm sound. I have, I have settled my KJV 1611. You understand that? Don't got to worry about it. So if it says charity, I say that's the right word. I, that's the right word. You understand that? I do learn what they mean. I do go use definitions. I try to make sure that the definitions don't disagree with the context. I always check the context. You understand? But I, my Bible's right. So I found out, you know, that that word charity is one of, of contention. And uh, I was reading after Dr. Knox, and um, he said that uh, they say that the word love should be used, uh, especially in 1 Corinthians 13. They say, uh, Dr. Knox, he, by definition, the book y'all gave me, by definition, uh, he states that charity is the love of God that's manifest in the life of a Christian toward other Christians. And uh, Dr. Knox, he specifically applies the word charity as our word. It's our word. Uh, he says that charity is what we feel toward one another. And that feeling, that, that, that love that we have for one another as brotherly love is a love that is in there because we know God. Now, I expand that definition in, in my view. I would say charity is to love everything that is of God. In that setting, the love of God will cause you to love all the things that are of God. You love the people of God. You love the house of God. You love the word of God. You love the things of God. You love the music of God. You love the altar. You love the pew. You love the piano. You love the pulpit. You love the Bible. Amen. It's about loving God and all the things. And that's the definition they give. And I'm not going to say that is exclusive, but it certainly applies. And can y'all say with me that if you are a person that sits under sound doctrine and if you are sound in your charity, you will love the things of God. Y'all agree with that? Amen. If you go to 1 Corinthians 13, the absence of charity produces a sounding of brass and a tinkling of cymbals. Y'all hear what I just said? Sounding of brass, tinkling Without charity, it don't sound sound. The absence of charity produces an emptiness in verse 2 that makes all their gifts as nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 2. So when you are not sound in your charity, the sounds you make, and he goes through some things that they, the sounds they make. He says prophesying, understanding mysteries, and knowledge. It's an empty sound. It's nothing. What about that? Man gets up prophesying, but he's not sound in his charity. Don't sound, sound. The absence of charity deletes any profit to your good works, according to verse number three, whether it is feeding the poor or even giving your life. If your charity is not sound, there's no profit to your efforts in verse three. Verse four, a person with sound charity would be one that suffers long and is kind. They will not vault themselves, which according to both Webster's and Dr. Knox means to boast and to make a vain display of one's own worth. A person that does that does not sound sound, and they don't sound sound because they don't have charity with the love of God. And the love of God does not cause you to love yourself. The love of God causes you to see yourself as you really are and to be thankful for the mercy and the grace of God that's been bestowed upon an unworthy sinner. I say amen. And although I know Disney in the world tells you to love yourself and, and to take care of yourself, amen, I say to you, love God. I say to you, love God's house and love God's word. Quit loving yourself and start loving the people of God. Start loving the people that need God, amen. And this is the idea of God's love within you. Amen, I need to hurry. I see people waiting outside. In verse 6, charity does not rejoice in iniquity. Charity does rejoice in truth. 
So a person who is not sound in their charity, their love of God, will rejoice in the wrong things and fail to rejoice in the right things. This sound of rejoicing will not sound sound in the ears of the sound. Amen. Verse 7, charity beareth, believeth, hopeth, and endureth all things. In this passage, we have the perseverance of the believer. In other words, when your charity is sound, you persevere in all things. This is exemplified in verse 8 that tells us charity never faileth. Amen. This is the love of God in the life of the believer. I say amen. Amen. When we either do not have this love or have allowed this love to wax cold, we become unsound in charity. And that produces a sound that is not sound. Furthermore, when we are not sound in charity, we will convey a love for the world. And that certainly is not a sound sound. When you hear them talking about how much they love the world, there's something wrong with that sound. The Bible said that Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. We're not supposed to love this present world. We're supposed to love lost people. Amen. Love the lost. Love mankind. Desire for man to be saved. But we're not supposed to love this world. We're not supposed to be of this world. We're in it, not of it. Y'all say amen at me, please. And so when you fall in love with this world, you're not sounding right. You're not sounding right. Then sound in patience, and I'm done. The word patience literally means to wait with endurance. This is also defined as patient continuance. Now, I would suggest that these three areas of soundness are progressional. When I look at it, I feel like they are. And of course, that's my study. And you may see it differently and even better. And I wouldn't have a problem with it. But when I see it, I see it as progressional. I, I don't think that you can claim any charity if you don't first have faith. Would y'all agree? I mean, you may have a carnal, fleshly, worldly love, but to have charity, you need the love of God. That's the love of God. You get the love of God by faith in God. Amen. Amen. I, I want all of y'all to know right now, I want you to know right now, if I weren't saved, I wouldn't like any of you. I am saved and I have a hard time with it now. Amen. You understand? My tendency is to go the other way. I'm a loner. I am. I, I'd, I'd rather be by myself unless with my wife. I love my wife. Amen. I love my children. Mostly. And, and I thank God for them. I love my grandchildren. Amen. Amen. It's amazing how my children resent my love for my grandchildren. But that's because they're not, they're not sound in their charity. You ought to hear Caleb whine about how I treated him when he was a boy and how I treat Josiah. And I'm looking at that big, giant, overgrown baby and saying, shut up. <laughs> well, Dad, you told me no, and Dad, you whipped me. And I said, that's right. And I beat the devil out of you. Now, you take him, and you take him home, and you beat the devil out of him. Yeah. Well, I ain't doing it. <laughs> I did my job. Can y'all say amen, please? Amen. My job is to kiss them and spoil them. And my job is to make it harder on my children. It's my job. Amen. That's sound. Amen. 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 So, sound and patience, it is progressional. Sound doctrine produces a soundness in both personal and public faith. Can you all agree with that? Sound doctrine produces a soundness in both personal and public faith. Can you say sound doctrine is what told me I was a sinner? Sound doctrine told me that I could trust in Jesus Christ and be saved. I heard the sound doctrine of salvation. I received the sound doctrine of salvation. I exercised faith and I am now saved. It was sound doctrine. Amen. Sound doctrine produces personal faith. Sound doctrine produces public faith and telling us how to live our life in front of this lost and dying world. I say amen. Then sound doctrine produces a soundness in your charity, the manifested love of God in the people of God and the things of God. Sound doctrine will cause you to have love in your heart for God, the things of God and the people of God. It's easy when you start picking up on a sound that don't sound just right, that they seem to have a problem with the things of God, some area. Recently, I had a man that I thought, at least I thought, 
that he loved the church. I recall preaching a sermon, and after the sermon, he come to me to let me know he just didn't agree, which is something he never did. He never did that before. And, and I, look, I got no problem if I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. Show me I'm wrong. And God, show me I'm wrong. I'll say, you know what? That's written right there. You're, you're right. I apologize. I missed that. I'll even stand in front of the church and say, hey, I missed that. I've done that. Brother Gordon has done that. We, we, I missed this. Brother Gordon did it recently in a passage out of Hebrews. He said, I preached it wrong. Amen. Missed it. You can miss it. Brother Tony told us you can miss it. And so uh, he come to me and he said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. It didn't sound right. And uh, now he's gone. This happened recently. And it's bad. And our church is reeling from it. And he's gone. And you know, you look back at it and you go, well, there were several times I, I, he, did, he didn't sound sound. And it turns out he was unsound. Are y'all hearing me? Because when you are not sound, you don't sound sound. In closing, not only does sound doctrine produce a soundness in your charity, but the sound doctrine produces a soundness, a wholeness in your patience. Your patient continues. You just, you just, brother Mark, I want to stay with God, man. I want to finish. I want to be sound, Tony. I mess up, but Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Give me your doctrine, Lord. Give it to me. Give me all your doctrine. Make me stronger. Make me more, more sound. If somebody comes up and knocks on the wood, it don't sound hollow, but it sounds through and through. Brother Tony, you come on.